So at the end of the last episode, we briefly looked at the problems of underfitting and overfitting. In this episode, I plan to explain both of these problems and what we can do to resolve them. Take a look at the following model. This model is said to underfit our data. Models which underfit our data have a low variance and a high bias, I'll explain this in a minute, and they tend to have less features. So in this case, we only have one feature, which is X. And by low variance, we mean that changes to our data results in small changes to our model's predicted values. So for example, if we were to add more data points, let's say here, and were to remove a few, what would happen to our model? So our model might just move down slightly like this, and there isn't a significant change in our model. So by high bias, we mean that our model assumes more about the form or trend that our data takes. So here we're assuming a linear model, when clearly that is not the case. So the opposite of underfitting is overfitting, we can look at this following model which overfits our data and we can see visually that there's a difference our model definitely follows the data points much more closely so models which overfit our data tend to have a high variance and a low bias so the exact opposite of models which underfit our data they tend to have many features so in this case we have x x squared x cubed x to the four and many more features a high variance so this means that changes to our data make significant or large changes to our model's predicted values. So for example, if we were to add new data points like here and here, and maybe remove a few, what would happen to our model? So because our model has many features and many parameters, so theta zero, theta one, theta two, and so on, our model can adjust for this and most likely create a line that will follow our data like so. So this has quite a large impact on our model's estimates. And by low bias, we mean that our model assumes less about the form or trend that our data takes. So here our model has many parameters and many features, so it can account for many different trends or patterns within the data. So we've looked at a model which underfits our data and a model which overfits our data. Now we're going to look at a good fit. A good fit captures the underlying trend within the data without capturing much noise. So data points which aren't part of this bowl-shaped trend such as these and these can be considered as noise. The models which fit our data well tend to have a low variance and a low bias. They tend to have a reasonable number of features. So here we have just three features and they perform well on test data. I plan to dedicate my next episode on explaining exactly what training data, cross-validation data and test data is, but I'll just give you guys a brief introduction now. We can sort of think of test data as data which is hidden in the calculation of our model so let's say, for example, we took the point 1013 and 0 0.5. So at 1013, a model predicts a value of roughly 0 0.48, let's say, whereas the actual test data said 0 0.5. So we have an error here of around 0 0.02, which is very low, showing that our model performs well on test data. So I went over that very quickly. I will be going over the concept of training data, cross-validation data, and test data in much more detail in my next episode. But what we essentially mean by test data is data which isn't included in the calculation of our model. So it can be thought of as sort of hidden data. And then we can see how our model performs on this test data and then make adjustments accordingly. So one thing to note is that as we increase variance, bias decreases and vice versa. As we decrease variance, bias increases. So we mentioned before that a good model has a, both a low variance and a low bias. And this illustration should hopefully explain why. Error rates, we can think of this as the amount of mistakes that our model makes or the amount of bad predictions it makes on our test data. So models which underfit our data have a high error rate and models which overfit our data also have a high error rate as expected. And obviously a good fit should have a low error rate. So we discussed before that models which underfit our data have a very low variance and models which overfit our data have a very high variance. And the same applies to, to bias, but this is flipped. So models with underfit our data have a high bias and the overfit our data have a low bias. And then there is this sweet point in the middle here where both our variance and bias are relatively low, but not too low or too high. So let's now go on to see how we can solve high bias and high variance problems, which is the problems you guys are most likely going to be coming across when you're building your own models. So here we took the example of the linear model and how this had a very high bias. So some of the symptoms of a high bias model is that it has a very high mean squared error. And by mean squared error, we mean the average distance our points are away from our model. We can see that our points are quite far in general from our model, and it performs poorly on our test data. And that is definitely expected if we were to have a test data point, for example, here, our model will predict 
a value of up here, which is a huge error. And ways that we can solve high bias problems is by adding more features. So for example, if we added theta two, perhaps x squared, then theta three x cubed, would enable us to create this sort of bowl shaped relationship. We could also reduce the amount of training data for example, removing these points here. However, it's always good to get as much data as possible to make sure that you're representing the population. So this is often not a good idea. So dealing with models that have a high variance, some of the symptoms are, we have a very low mean squared error, and that can be shown here since all of our data points are very close to our model. So models with a high variance also perform poorly on our test data. So let's say for example, we were to have a test data point of around here. So here our model has made quite a significant error on our test data. If we were to however have a model which fits our data well, that sort of captures this x squared trend, we can see that the error is reduced quite a bit. So some of the solutions of a high variance model, you, might, you guys might be able to guess it. So one is to reduce the number of features. So for example, if we were to cancel out some of these features here and just include these features, we would get a model much closer to this sort of bowl shape curve. And we can also increase the amount of training data and this is fine since we want more data that represents our population to produce a more accurate model. So if we were to include more data, let's say around here, so our model is sort of forced to include all of these data points, but if it doesn't have enough parameters, it will sort of generalize and just sort of try to get the general trend like so. We can also apply something called regularization, which can be thought of as a process of reducing all of our parameters, theta zero, theta one, theta two, theta three, and so on. And this in turn reduces our model's variance. So why does reducing our model's parameters reduce our model's variance? I hope to explain in the next few slides. So let's say for example, we were to have the model y hat equals two x squared. So in this case, our parameter is two and small changes to our x make quite large changes to our y. So for example, at the point one, we have a, a y value of two. And at the point two, we have a y value of eight. So here, we just increased our value of x by one and we've made quite a significant change of around six. So this model can be thought of as having a high variance. Let's say now we were to reduce our parameter theta from two to 0 0.5. So now small changes to x makes large changes to our predicted values y. For example, at the point one, we have a y value of 0 0.5. And at the point two, we have a y value of two. So here we increased x by one and we've only made a change of about 1.5. So in this case, our model has a low variance. By simply reducing our parameter from two to 0 0.5, we have changed our model from having a high variance to a low variance. So the way in which regularization reduces our parameters is by making a small adjustment to our gradient descent algorithm. So with our initial gradient descent algorithm, we set all of our parameters to zero, and then we repeat it until convergence, until our cost function was minimized, and then we read off all of the parameter values. So gradient descent with regularization essentially follows the same concept as gradient descent, but we're just making a few extra adjustments to our parameters. Again, we're setting all of our parameters to zero. But in this case, we keep theta zero with the initial gradient descent algorithm as reducing theta zero does not have an impact on our model's variance. So we're much more concerned with our parameters that are attached to our features. For example, we had theta one x plus theta two x squared. So all of these parameters which are followed by a feature or a variable it's other ones we want to reduce. And the way in which we reduce each variable is again, via gradient descent. So we're, so we're subtracting alpha times the derivative of our cost function. But here we're also subtracting this regularization element, which essentially further reduces all of our parameters and hence reduces our model's overall variance. So with ordinary gradient descent, we were subtracting each of our model's parameters by a value of alpha times the partial derivative of the cost function but now here with gradient descent and regularization, we're not only subtracting it by alpha times the partial derivative of the cost function, but also subtracting it by alpha times lambda over m times theta i. So making a further reduction to each of our parameters. Looking at this regularization element more closely, both alpha and lambda are what we call hyperparameters, which are essentially parameters that we pick ourselves, which are used to control the learning process or how we calculate our parameters. So one thing to note is if we pick a high value of lambda, we are going to be reducing each of our values of theta i more, hence further decreasing the variance of our model. And you guys should remember that m represents the total number of training examples. So let's take our notorious high variance model and apply regularization. And in this case, we're going to set lambda to be a very high value of 10 to the power of 10. 
And this will result in all of our parameters, theta 1, theta 2, all the way to theta n, to be reduced very close to zero, which essentially makes all of these features redundant, which will result in a very low variance model of y hat equals theta zero. So applying regularization with an extremely high value of lambda significantly reduces the variance of our model. So how do we choose a good value for lambda, which results in a low variance model, but not too low? So unfortunately, the value for lambda is data dependent. So fortunately, we have to experiment with different values of lambda and see how that has an effect on our model's performance on our test data. A good method of narrowing down a good value for lambda is by trying lambda equals 0.1 and then going up by scales of times 10. So 0.1, 1, 10, 100, and 1,000. And then from there, we can narrow down a good value for lambda. Let's say, for example, we found the range to be between 1 and 10 resulted in a good performance of our model. We can then try lambda equals 5 and then narrow down to a good value for lambda. So in summary, underfitting occurs when our model fails to capture the underlying trend in our data. And for that, we looked at the linear model and how it failed to recognize this bowl-shaped trend. Overfitting occurs when our model includes too much noise and fails to capture the general trend. And for that, we looked at that spaghetti model where it fitted our data too closely, resulting in poor performance in our test data. And lastly, a good fit has both a low bias and a low variance. And we looked at how we can reduce both our bias and variance. And we looked at one important element called regularization, which is used to reduce the variance of our model by reducing our parameter values.